Welcome to Front Porch Gospel this morning. So glad to have you here today. I missed seeing you all last week. I was actually, to, to tell you where I was at, I was in Harrison, Arkansas, our, my home church, 50th anniversary. They asked us to be a part of that service. It was a great time, but missed being with you all. Uh, this Sunday, Pastor Tony and Frieda are gone visiting relatives, and so they'll be back later on this week. But anyway, we're going to go ahead and have church anyways. That's okay. And so why don't you turn around and say hi to three or four or five people around you. Glad to have you all wa watching at home. We're going to have a good time today. Put your hands together. They drove me up the hilltops. I am man. They made me carry the cross, Thomas. I am man. I am the man, Thomas. I am the man. Look at these nails, God's here in my hand.
have daffodils that are, that are popping up. Any of, anybody else have flowers popping up in their place? So they, isn't that great? And uh, this last Wednesday, how many were here for Ash Wednesday service? Wasn't that a wonderful service? I just thought, Miss Liddy's out in the hallway so I can brag on her. She did it, just a great job putting that together. And so anyway, we are in the, officially in the Lent season right now, and we want to start off uh, speaking on Journey to the Cross and uh, the story of Zacchaeus. Now, I know that everybody in this room, maybe not everybody, but most everybody, grew up singing a little song that I want you to sing with me, okay? Zacchaeus was a wee little man, wee little man was he, he climbed up in the sycamore tree, the Savior for to see, and when the Savior passed him by, he looked up in the tree, what did he say? Zacchaeus, please come down, and this will tell you where you learned the song. I learned, because I'm going to your house for tea, that must have been the English version. <laughs> Everybody else says, for you going to your house today, but I said, for you going to your house for tea. It must have been the English version of that. It was tea time. But everybody remembers that song. In, in uh, the book of Luke, chapter 19, we're going to read the story about Zacchaeus. Jesus entered Jericho, was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus, and he was a chief tax collector, and he was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him and Jesus was coming that, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and he said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, he is gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is the son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. What's not mentioned in that cute little kid's song was that Zacchaeus was a tax collector. Which reminds me, have you filed your taxes yet? Lord, Wes, you know how to really bring up a bad mood, don't you? Well, you still have some time before. It's August 18th. I mean, they keep changing the date on it. I mean, I was always geared towards the 15th, and I ought to probably still be geared toward the 15th so I get it done by the 18th. But make sure you're honest, or you won't have a good conscience. Because supposedly, supposedly, an actual letter was received by the IRS a few years ago. 
Enclosed, you will find a check for $150. I cheated on my income tax return last year and have not been able to sleep ever since. If I still have trouble sleeping, I'll send you the rest. <laughs> this morning, we're focused on the equivalent of a regional office chief of the IRS, a man who did not cheat on his own taxes, but on everyone else's. As we begin the Lenten season, we want to walk through the steps of Jesus as he sets his face towards Jerusalem prior to his triumphal entry and his subsequent crucifixion. You may recall that Jesus had performed some of his greatest miracles right before this event. He had recently raised Lazarus from the dead after being buried, and his fame was spreading like a tsunami. Then when Jesus was approaching the town of Jericho, he encountered a blind man by the name of Bartimaeus, a poor beggar from the lowest economic class. And Jesus performed another wonderful miracle by restoring Bartimaeus' sight. Now as we look at Luke chapter 19, we see that Jesus is passing through Jericho on the final leg of his faithful trip to Jerusalem, where he encounters Zacchaeus, a very wealthy government tax man from the top rung of the economic ladder. Now, an internet search came up with hundreds of pretty mean jokes about IRS agents, such as this one. What's the difference between an IRS agent and a mosquito? One is a blood-sucking parasite and the other is an insect. <laughs> Isn't it terrible? Or, what do you call 25 IRS agents buried in cement? Not enough cement. <laughs> you know who tells these jokes best are IRS agents. It's like lawyers tell them on each other, too. And I'm sure you'd agree that those are very unfair characterizations of people doing their job for our government. But the point is that even today, tax agents are feared and disliked. Now multiply that distrust and hatred a hundred times for Zacchaeus for three reasons. First, as a tax collector, he worked for Rome and was therefore considered a traitor by the Jewish people. The second is that tax collectors in general were allowed to squeeze more than what the government demanded and more the more you could get, the more you made. It was, it was on a percentage basis. And third, verse 2 tells us that Zacchaeus was the chief tax collector, meaning he was the head supervisor of the local tax office. This meant he got a commission not only off the money he collected, but he had other collectors working for him. And he stood on top of the collection pyramid, stuffing his pockets with shekels before he sent the required taxes, taxes to Rome. This is why Luke tells us at the end of verse 2 that he was rich. All this meant that Zacchaeus was correctly perceived as a greedy, predatory, and traitor. He would have been thought about as fondly today as a high-level drug dealer. At this time, Jesus' popularity was on a level of a celebrity, rock star, or professional athlete. I mean, he had just raised Lazarus from the dead. And if you've been coming to Wednesday night Bible studies, you understand a little bit more of what this means. That Lazarus wasn't just some person out there that nobody knew. He was a very, very well-known people of society. These things were happening. This is the reason the Pharisees stepped up their plan to, to kill Jesus, because he was absolutely a star at this point in time. Everyone knew about this prophet from Nazareth, and large uh, crowds would gather to see him. Which brings us to Zacchaeus. Now let's be honest. What is the first thing that comes to your mind when you think of Zacchaeus? Do you think about a rich man? Do you think about a man who was chief tax collector, who had other tax collectors working for him? No. You remember Zacchaeus because why? He is short of stature. A wee little man. Let's remember, the general population of the day wasn't that tall to begin with, and they were on average much shorter than our present day population. So if they were short to begin with, then Zacchaeus must have been very diminutive. This was probably something that he dealt with all his life. As a child, he probably wasn't picked first for athletic teams because of his size. In fact, I would imagine he was ridiculed and picked on by the other boys that he grew up with. So when he had his chance, he decided, I'll show them as he began to rise the corporate ladder of the Roman tax collection system. All those bullies who had treated him so badly in his early years were now under his authority, and he was exacting his revenge. You see, Roman tax collectors were unscrupulous and ruthless. Rome didn't care if they were fair. They only wanted their quota of taxes collected. 
And Zacchaeus must have been one of the best. Needless to say, Zacchaeus may have been rich, but he probably didn't have very many friends. He was a social outcast in spite of his wealth. The thing he had longed for as a child was to be accepted. And he felt if he'd become wealthy and successful, then society would accept him. But he was wrong. So this lonely rich man hears about the celebrity Jesus coming to town. He wants to get a glimpse of the celebrity. So he climbs up a tree to see Jesus. Now this is unusual for a couple of reasons. and explains something about where Zacchaeus was in his search. First, it was considered very undignified for a wealthy, rich person to run. They just didn't do that. But he was running as fast as he could to get to where he could see Jesus. Second, it's unimaginable that a rich man would shimmy up a tree to see Jesus, climbing up a tree like that. Sycamore trees often grew by the roadside and had branches that grew out horizontally, not just, uh, not just vertically, but horizontally from the trunk, which would give Zacchaeus a very good view of Jesus. What this tells us is Zacchaeus was determined to see Jesus and really didn't care about what anybody thought about him. He refused to allow anything, not the crowd, nor his station in life, to stand between him and his desire to see the Lord Jesus. What Jesus does next totally rocks Zacchaeus' world. Jesus sees Zacchaeus, calls him out by name, and invites himself to Zacchaeus' home. Think about this. I don't think we fully understand the implications of this act. Jesus was crossing a whole lot of lines right here. Now, if you look in Luke chapter 18, Jesus almost foreshadows this meeting with Zacchaeus when he tells the parable about the Pharisee and the tax collector. Chapter 18, verse 9, to whom to some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like the other people, the robbers, the evildoers, the adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven. But he beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. What you have to understand is that a Pharisee was considered the top of the social scale, uh, uh, in the social scale, and a tax collector was below, listen to me, below the bottom of the social scale. Notice how the hypocritical Pharisee lists robbers, evildoers, and adulterers ahead of the tax collector. That's how much the average Jew hated tax collectors. They were considered the worst of the worst. Traitors because they worked for the, Ro for the hated Romans and thieves because most of them were dishonest in their dealings. So when Jesus invites himself to Zacchaeus' home, he creates quite a stir among the local population. Now I think we have to forget that Zacchaeus also had to make a decision. He had to decide if he wanted to have Jesus come to his house. Would Jesus publicly rebuke him for being an unscrupulous tax collector? Would Jesus drag his name through the mud and make him look even worse than he already did? These were probably all things that were going through Zacchaeus' mind. But he invited the master to his house. But why? There must have been something in the way that Jesus greeted him, in the way that he talked to Zacchaeus. Jesus was different than anyone that Zacchaeus had ever met in his life. He didn't ridicule Zacchaeus like the children that had tormented him as a child. He didn't owe Zacchaeus taxes, so he didn't, he, Jesus wasn't trying to buddy up to him to save some money. Jesus legitimately wanted to get to know Zacchaeus. And this absolutely dumbfounded Zacchaeus. He was an outcast, a misfit, and yet Jesus wanted to get to know him. Another interesting thing is that Jesus never told Zacchaeus to give back any money that he had swindled. You see that? Nothing in the scriptures says that Jesus says that. 
Back in Luke chapter 18, Jesus had met the rich young ruler. Remember, remember that encounter? He was actually a righteous man, a good guy. And he said, go and give his money to the poor. When the young ruler walked away, Jesus made the statement, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. And again, if you've been, if you've been coming to Wednesday night Bible studies, you understand that Jesus knew what he was talking about because he did not come from a poor background. Pretty heavy stuff. But here is a heathen sinner, lowest of the low, voluntarily saying that he will give half his possessions to the poor and repaying anyone he's cheated four times the amount he cheated him. That is extraordinary. Because these responses exceeded the cultural and religious expectations of the day. First of all, it was considered extravagant to give 20% of your money away. And here's that kid who say, I'm going to give half. And when he made restitution of four times, he was following the standard required in the Jewish law when a man was convicted of stealing a sheep. But if such a person confessed to the crime himself, this is the way the law was stated, without being found out, he was only required to restore what was stolen and to add 20% interest on that, just 20%. Zacchaeus' response shows that he was willing to make restitution as if it had been proven against him in a court of law. The man understood redemption. He knew that his behavior, his behavior was the worst kind and was eager to make things right no matter what the cost. So why would a heathen man like Zacchaeus do that and a righteous man like the rich young ruler not? Because for the first time in his life, Zacchaeus felt accepted. He was no longer an outcast. All the cheating and swindling to build wealth was actually a ploy to be rich enough just to be accepted. That's what he wanted all along. And here Jesus passes by and says, I accept you. I want to be your friend. And the miraculous transformation begins immediately. You see, that's what people are looking for today. They just want to know that someone loves and accepts them. People are crying out for acceptance. And this is what acceptance means. I care about you. I want to be your friend, and you can change for the better. Now, I want you to listen to this, though. Acceptance does not mean I agree with your lifestyle. I turn a blind eye to the wrong things you do with your life, and you don't need to change. Because some people are getting confused about that. It's very important that we know the difference. Jesus spent his time around publicans, tax collectors, and sinners, but he didn't change his lifestyle and become a sinner, nor did he condone what they did. He didn't say, oh, it's okay. He just befriended them and called them to repentance just like everyone else, everybody on the same, on the same level. You see, when we accept people and befriend them, we show them the same love and compassion that we should show our best friend or family member, remember. But if we shoot it to them straight, we're not afraid to call sin, sin, but we let them know that we can overcome it. We can sit, be set free, just like Zacchaeus. They'll have a life-altering experience. And right here, I want to put a little plug in. Trisha and I went and saw a movie that I would highly, highly encourage all of you to see. Friday night, we went and saw a movie called Jesus Revolution. It's about, it's about the hippie revival that happened back in the early 70s. What's, what's neat is, is, is I actually on the tail end of that had, had part of that experience also. It's very powerful. You, you go and get your friends to go. It's, it's a great thing. But the, the context of that movie is basically you had these people just like Zacchaeus. They were outcasts. They, they, do, they, they didn't fit in with, with our culture. And someone loved them and accepted them. And you know what? Something amazing happened. I'm not going to tell you more because I, I want you to watch the movie. So... When Jesus was confronted with a woman that had been caught committing adultery, he accepted her. Again, I'm not going to say any more. If you've been here Wednesday night Bible study, it puts a whole different twist on it, doesn't it? I'm not going to say any more. You need to come to Wednesday night Bible study. Or you can look at them online. They're online. We're putting them online. He didn't tell her that what she did was right. He didn't say that God understood that she couldn't help herself. He just accepted her and protected her from her accusers. 
And then he told her to go and sin no more. Did she ever commit another sin in her life? Of course. That's not what Jesus meant. He was saying, don't habitually go and do the exact same thing that got you into this place. Stop. Don't continue this vicious cycle of self-destruction. Go and sin no more. So this morning, Jesus calls you and I to his love and his acceptance. He calls us to repentance during this Lenten season. All we like sheep have gone astray. But he's also called us to sin no more and to be set free. Be delivered of the life-controlling habits that have kept us prisoner. That is why he went to the cross, so that you and I can have abundant life, a life full of joy, a life that is free, and a life full of acceptance. Will you pray with me this morning? Father, I just